Hello and welcome. You found the Social Work Podcast. My name is Jonathan Singer, and I'll be your host as we explore all things social work. Today's podcast is on supervision for social workers. In the mid-1990s, I worked for an outpatient crisis unit for children and adolescents. We provided assessment, intervention, and short-term stabilization therapy for children who are suicidal, homicidal, or actively psychotic. Because of the severity of the presenting problems and the risk for imminent harm, we would consult with each other and the psychiatrist on every case. Case consultation was daily and sometimes an hourly event. In these case consultations, we talked about what was going on with the kid, the family, the other agencies, organizations, or group with which they might have been involved. We staffed cases in real time in order to make sure that we were getting all of the information we needed to keep the kids alive. We also got feedback on what we might have missed in our assessments or what information might be useful for treatment planning and next steps. Once a week for two hours, the agency hired relief workers to cover the phones and take care of drop-ins so that the full-time staff, like myself, could attend a weekly staff meeting. When I started working on the crisis unit, I expected that these weekly staff meetings would provide us an opportunity to get in-depth clinical supervision and direction for the treatment of our cases. Instead, we talked about billing codes, 90-day review cycles, which signatures were required on which pieces of paper, in which new assessments were required by the state to qualify for reimbursement. Although it seems obvious now, it wasn't until I'd spent some time at the agency that I realized that we had scheduled administrative supervision during our weekly staff meetings, but we had informal clinical supervision. And these were these case consultations that happened on the spot. In order to qualify for my advanced clinical license, I had to seek outside clinical supervision because there are important differences between administrative and clinical supervision. And there's also a difference between clinical supervision for licensure and ongoing post-license clinical consultation. In an excellent article on supervision, Miriam Coleman distinguishes between consultation and supervision. Consultation, she writes, may involve some of the same functions as supervision, but lacks the administrative responsibility and accountability. Consultants can make recommendations, but have no power to sanction against a social worker when problems arise. In today's podcast, I'll talk about some of the basic concepts in supervision. Like many of the social work podcasts, much has been written about the topic of supervision, more than can be covered in this short podcast. If you're interested in learning more about supervision or becoming a supervisor, schools of social work like the University of Texas at Austin and Smith College School of Social Work have outstanding continuing education programs dedicated to training clinical supervisors. There are dozens of independent continuing education programs as well as books and articles on the topic. And, as always, links to further reading and resources can be found at the Social Work Podcast website at socialworkpodcast.com. Today's podcast on supervision addresses a topic that's really relevant to social workers at all stages of their career. It also sets the stage for an upcoming three-part series on phone supervision in which I'll be talking over the phone with two social workers who provide phone supervision and consultation. I also talk with a social worker who chose to receive phone supervision towards a advanced clinical license because she was unable to find an approved supervisor locally. And now on to the podcast on supervision. The 2005 NASW Standards for Clinical Social Work states that clinical social workers shall maintain access to professional supervision and or consultation. The standards stipulate that social workers should receive supervision for the first five years of their professional experience. After five years, social workers are expected to receive supervision and consultation on an as-needed basis. When social workers have their clinical licenses, the NASW guidelines recommend that social workers offer training and mentoring opportunities to beginning social workers. Supervision is seen as a continuous and meaningful part of the profession. So what is supervision? According to the NASW, supervision is the relationship between the supervisor and the supervisee that promotes the development of responsibility, skill, knowledge, 
attitudes, and ethical standards in the practice of clinical social work. The priority in the supervision process is accountability for client care within the parameters and ethical standards of the social work profession. So there are three types of supervision. There's administrative, clinical, also called educational, and supportive supervision. Administrative supervision. The most basic function of administrative supervision is to ensure that work is performed. Most social workers receive administrative supervision at their agencies. This, of course, was the type of supervision that I was receiving on a weekly basis at the crisis unit. So how do you know if you're receiving administrative supervision? Well, your supervisor talks with you about paperwork compliance, billing, administrative procedures for changes in codes and categories. Now, as boring as this might sound or as tedious as it is, administrative supervision is crucial in maintaining agency functioning. Every time my supervisor talked about billing codes, she was making sure that our agency would be reimbursed for services rendered. Without proper attention to billing and compliance with the myriad of oversight agencies and funding sources, most social service agencies couldn't survive audits or pay the bills. Clinical supervision is also known as educational supervision. Clinical supervision is concerned with teaching the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that are important for clinical tasks. Some social workers receive clinical supervision at their agencies. So how do you know if you're receiving clinical supervision? Well, you meet on a regular basis with your supervisor to discuss client issues such as assessment, diagnosis, treatment options, barriers to care, medication support, etc. Clinical supervision, like the therapeutic relationship itself, starts with rapport building, establishes a purpose for supervision, and determines when the relationship will be over. Clinical supervisors can and should use all of the skills they have developed as clinicians in a supervisory context. Supervision looks different based on different settings, clinical needs, and supervisor orientation. For example, if you're receiving supervision for work in the addictions field, it might be that your supervisor will ask you to identify which stage of change your client is in. In contrast, if you're working in a child and family treatment agency, your supervisor might ask you to identify your client's developmental stage or the stage of the family life cycle. Although there are different approaches to clinical supervision, including formal case presentation, technique-specific approaches, some common clinical supervisory questions might include, what is your role with the client? What goals have you and your client established for treatment? What challenges do you have with treatment right now? The final type of supervision is called supportive supervision, and this type of supervision is typically not separate from administrative or clinical supervision, but it has the function of increasing job performance and decreasing burnout. Supervision has traditionally occurred in person, and that's regardless of whether it's administrative, clinical, or supportive. Um, But because of advances in technology, more and more people are using the phone and Internet technologies like chat rooms and email to obtain their supervision. Now, regardless of the medium, supervision can occur individually or in groups, and each state has different regulations about what counts towards supervision. For example, in Pennsylvania... Uh, New regulations stipulate that social workers uh, can receive no more than 50% of their supervision towards advanced clinical licensure in a group setting. In this next section, I'm going to talk about how supervision can be used at three different stages of a social work career. The student stage, uh, the professional working towards advanced clinical license, and finally, the independent practitioner stage. I'll also reference relevant standards and guidelines developed by the National Association of Social Workers, NASW, and the Council on Social Work Education, CSWE. For social workers at all stages of their career, good supervision prevents burnout, improves the quality of clinical care, and reduces liability. The Council on Social Work Education's 2004 Educational Policies and Accreditation Standards, also known as EPAS, state that the supervision is essential to social work practice. Graduates of either BSW or MSW programs are expected to demonstrate 12 abilities, one of which is the use of supervision and consultation. Students are required to receive supervision in field placements. Field supervision has an educational focus, 
and is expected to accomplish a number of goals. One goal is to ensure that students are providing ethical and clinically appropriate services. Another goal is to help students to develop into professionals. A third purpose is to help students understand how coursework is translated into practice. In any given class, students are provided with more information than they can be expected to grasp, and certainly more than they are expected to implement in the field. Good field supervision allows students to bounce ideas off of supervisors that they learned about in class and to gain insight into how those ideas or theories actually work in the quote unquote real world. Supervision is important after graduation as well. Supervision is important for obtaining advanced clinical licenses that are often required for third party reimbursement, whether that be federal insurance like Medicaid, Medicare, or state children's health insurance plan, also known as SCHIP. Or even private insurance like Blue Cross Blue Shield. Before you enter a supervisory relationship towards advanced clinical licensure, it's important to make sure that your supervisor has all of the credentials necessary to sign off on your supervision. You'd hate to spend three years working with somebody and then find out that, in fact, they don't have the qualifications necessary to sign that piece of paper. Now, I know this sounds obvious, but the rules and regulations for clinical supervision differ from state to state. Here's a recent example from New Jersey. An article in the January 11th, 2008 edition of Asbury Park Press reported that five social workers in New Jersey were suing their employer, Meridian Health System, for misrepresenting their supervisor's credentials to provide their supervision towards advanced clinical licensure. According to the article, in the state of New Jersey, clinical supervisors must have an LCSW and have completed 20 continuing education credits of postgraduate coursework related to supervision. Now, here's where it's important to be clear on your supervisor's credentials. Although the plaintiff's supervisor was an LCSW and had been since 1994, apparently he didn't have the 20 continuing education hours of coursework related to supervision. So, what do you do if your agency supervisor does not have the credentials? Well, you seek outside supervision like I did at the crisis unit. Now, because of Social Work's unique focus on the person and environment, it's usually preferred to have a social worker as your clinical supervisor. If, however, you are unable to find a clinical social worker, there are some states that allow approved psychologists and licensed professional counselors to provide clinical supervision. Supervision is also expected of social workers who have achieved their advanced clinical license. And are able to practice independently and receive third party reimbursement. The NASW standards for clinical social work stipulate that clinical social workers should maintain access to professional supervision andor consultation. So, why would a social worker who has obtained an advanced clinical license and is able to practice independently maintain、uh, supervision? Well, the fact is that most social workers. Work in agency settings that expect them to provide services to a wide variety of clients with a wide variety of problems. Now, there are a handful of clinical social workers in private practice who are established and have enough flexibility that they can choose who they work with. For the rest of us, the social work axiom of starting where the client is sometimes means that. We're presented with problems that are outside of our area of expertise. Supervision and consultation becomes a way for us to acquire additional knowledge and skills that are required to provide excellent clinical care. Supervision helps us to recognize when we're practicing beyond the scope of our expertise and need to refer to another social worker. For example, when I was working in a small private social service agency in Austin, Texas, I was assigned a woman whose husband of 50 years had recently died. Her stated reason for seeking services was to deal with the overwhelming sadness she was experiencing. Although I had experience with working with grief and loss issues in children, I had never worked with adult grief and loss. I spoke with the director of the agency about my concerns. He provided administrative supervision and asked that I complete the intake and then refer if necessary. According to the NASW guidelines, it's appropriate for me to provide services to this client as long as I let her know that I do not have the expertise in working with adults with grief and loss issues, and as long as I seek clinical supervision and consultation about all areas of treatment, including assessment, diagnosis, course of treatment, best practices, issues of transference and counter transfers, and termination and referral.
By providing this information, the client can consent to services knowing what I can and cannot do. And this is called informed consent. After taking the intake assessment, I met with my clinical supervisor, who was different than my administrative supervisor, and it became clear to me that I would be unable to provide the type of clinical care that this woman deserved. So I made a referral to somebody who could. Through a combination of administrative and clinical consultation, I was able to provide the appropriate level of clinical care. Had I been in a situation where there were no referral options, I would have needed to obtain intensive supervision and outside education in order to provide appropriate services. Supervision is important not only to ensure quality clinical care, but also as a way of reducing liability. Social workers are increasingly the targets of malpractice lawsuits. Although courts do not require social workers to be perfect, they do require us to be professional. Now, how do courts know what professional services look like? Well, they can look at the NASW standards for clinical practice and see if you've been following them. They can also call social workers in who perform the same kind of work as you and ask them to review your documentation to determine whether or not you are providing a reasonable standard of care. That is, the courts want to know if you were doing what any other reasonable social worker would have done in your place. Documented supervision is a way of showing the courts that you were following the NASW guidelines and that your treatment decisions were reviewed by others and modifications were made, if appropriate, based on supervision or consultation. In other words, documenting your supervision is a way of making sure that you're providing a reasonable standard of care, thus reducing liability. For most of the podcast, I've talked about supervision from the perspective of social workers who are receiving supervision. Social workers who provide supervision are expected to uphold certain ethical standards that are outlined in the NASW Code of Ethics. These can be found on the NASW website at socialworkers.org. The four ethical responsibilities for supervision and consultation are social workers should have the necessary knowledge and skill to supervise or consult appropriately and should only do so within their areas of knowledge and competence. Social workers who provide supervision or consultation are responsible for setting clear, appropriate, and culturally sensitive boundaries. Social workers should not engage in any dual or multiple relationships with supervisees in which there is a risk of exploitation or potential harm to the supervisee. And finally, social workers who provide supervision should evaluate supervisees' performance in a manner that is fair and respectful. To summarize... Supervision is a relationship between a supervisor and a supervisee. Social workers typically receive both administrative and clinical supervision. According to the standards set by the Council on Social Work Education and the National Association of Social Workers, social workers are required to receive supervision during their social work program and for five years after graduation. For ethical, clinical, and liability reasons, Ongoing clinical supervision and consultation is strongly recommended for social workers with their advanced clinical licenses. Supervision can be face-to-face, -face, over the phone, or even over email, and can occur individually or in group settings. For social workers who find themselves working with a problem area or a population for which they have little training, or for social workers who are in agencies or geographic locations where clinical supervision is not available, Phone and email supervision are important alternatives to traditional face-to-face -face supervision. Because the issue of phone and web-based social work services is increasingly important, the next few podcasts will address phone supervision, both from the supervisor's and the supervisee's point of view. Please join us. So, I'm Jonathan Singer. Thanks for being with me today for this episode of the Social Work Podcast. If you missed an episode, visit our website at socialworkpodcast.com. If you have suggestions for future podcasts, please email me at jonathan at socialworkpodcast.com. And to all the social workers out there, keep up the good work. We'll see you back here next time at the Social Work Podcast.